Hello! Uh, today we are going to be covering the theories of religion in this PowerPoint. We're going to start off looking at the etymology. Um, the word religion comes from the Latin word religio, which means the fear or awe one feels in the presence of a spirit or God. <clears throat> so let's look first at the characteristics of religion. And when we say characteristics, what I mean is that there are certain elements within most religions that, comparatively speaking, seem to exist across the board. So the first one we want to look at is that usually, but not always, religion deals in some way with people's relationship to the unseen world of spirits, ancestors, gods, and demons. And this is one of my favorite demons. Um, now if you think that it looks like a bat then you're right because of course bats are nocturnal creatures they only come out at night and therefore they do represent more of that frightening aspect as opposed to an animal that's out in the daytime like a dog um, second they have a developed system of myth about the unseen world and rituals designed for communing with this unseen world so in most religions there are certain rituals that have to be enacted to have a good relationship with the god or gods that one is worshiping continuing on number three there is a developed system of organized rituals de temples priests and scriptures at some point in their history so it's organized it has a bureaucracy in a sense that it has levels and it has expectations Number four, they usually have some statement about life beyond death, either as survival in some version of heaven or hell, or through reincarnation. Um, and what we're looking at here is what happens after we die. And mankind will never figure this out because you have to die to know. So we have heaven, we have hell, we have purgatory, we have the void. Some religions like Hinduism and Buddhism believe in reincarnation. So there is some statement about what happens after our physical body moves on. Um, one of the major characteristics of religion is they usually have a code of conduct or moral expectations. And you'll see here, this is one of the most famous ones, which is the Ten Commandments. And of course, you have to have followers. If you don't have followers, you have a religion that you are the only one who follows. So um, generally, you see large groups, either in the past or currently. There's some religions that used to be very, very popular, but have sort of died out because of various reasons. But at some point, they were very popular. So let's look at where religion comes from, at least according to these theories. We're going to look at animistic theory, nature worship theory, theory of original monotheism, and the magic theory. All right, so let's start with the animistic theory. It was developed by Edward Burnett Tyler. He was an anthropologist in the 19th century, 1800s. And what you have to keep in mind contextually is that this is when Charles Darwin wrote his seminal book about evolution. And what Tyler did was he took the idea of evolution and applied it to culture. So he was the leading proponent of cultural evolutionism. And um, how he came about this is while he was studying primitive societies, he came to believe that the primitives believed the entire world even the air is alive with spirits. These spirits could help or harm, and they each had personalities. And this led to the concept of sacrifice and worship to avoid potentially offending them. So you have to, you know, give them certain things to make them happy, whether it is sacrificing animal, sacrificing someone important to the tribe. The idea is to keep them happy so they won't get mad and punish you. This type of worship led to the polytheistic religions of the ancient world. And polytheism is the belief in many gods. 
Uh, the next person we're going to look at is Robert Henry Codrington, and he was a student of Tyler's. He identified the concept of mana, which is the supernatural power that belonged to the re region of the unseen, and it can be used for good or for bad. So this mana, this supernatural power, is how the gods reward or punish humans. Then we get into the nature worship theory. So, and it was developed by Max Muller, again, 19th century. And what he believed is that religion began as primitive people began to understand the phases of nature, the seasons, the moon, the tides. And they responded by personalizing them, giving names to describe the activities of these forces, which eventually became mythology. So Apollo originally meant sun, and um, these mythologies gave life to these forces. Moving on to the theory of original monotheism. This was developed by Wilhelm Schmidt in the 20th century. It's derived from the animist and polytheistic view, but in this case, Schmidt was looking at a high god who serves as the creator of the world and the parent of the lesser deities. The characteristics of a high god, they're eternal, they live forever, immortality. They're omniscient, meaning that they are all-knowing. Beneficent, meaning they act for the benefit of others. They're moral, they define the world order, what's right and what's wrong. And they're omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. So these are the characteristics that across the board, no matter what of the major religions you're looking at, they all seem to have these characteristics. Then we're going to look at magic theory. And this was developed by Sir James Fraser, early 20th century. He agrees with Tyler and extended his argument by classifying religious evolution. So stage one, people tried to control the world through of nature through magic. When people realized that the natural world could not be controlled by magic, society developed religion, where God or the gods can be called upon to cooperate if sacrifices are made. In other words, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch my back. Stage three is when religion fails, people often turn to science as a way to understand nature. So if you think about how we deal these days with some of the illnesses, you know, um, Back in the olden days, they would have magi or magicians trying to, you know, um, create a cure. And that evolved into religion. And so the priests would pray and the families would pray. And then at some point, prayer was not enough. And science evolved so that people understood that when you have a bad heart, there's certain specific scientific elements that have to be done in order to preserve the life of that person. So that's the <clears throat> anthropological, cultural perspectives of religion. Now we're going to look at three theories that are a little bit different, and they are called projections of human needs. And these theories look at why man desires to create a religious institution. We're going to look at Ludwig Feuerbach, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. So let's start off with Ludwig Feuerbach, 19th century. He believed that religions were essentially the projection of our wishes and needs for humanity. And he argued that people tend to see themselves as helpless and dependent when faced with the challenges of life. We don't feel like we can do something on our own, so we seek out an unseen God that will give us the courage and strength to overcome our difficulties. He also said that people imagine, uh, imagine an idealized being of goodness or power who can help them. And our idea of God is often represented by Jesus and how Jesus helped the poor and he didn't care if you were a prostitute or someone who was um sickened and had diff different terrible diseases, you know, we have this idea of 
God being this wonderful, good person. But if you go back to the Old Testament of the Bible, God is an angry God. He's a vengeful God. So people, what, are, um, what Fierbach is arguing is that people shaped their vision of God to help them. So you see this transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament from, you know, 2,000 years ago where God went from being that punishing figure to the figure who is going to help them. Um, additionally, God is created in the image of an idealized humanity, not that God created man in his image. And again, you know, this is Feuerbach's theories. And you have to remember that a theory is not something that's definitely proven. It's an idea that he is able to support. Feuerbach also believed that as people became knowledgeable or powerful, religion tends to be less important and it's replaced with technology and politics. Moving on to Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a uh, political theorist of the 19th century and he wrote a book um, called the Communist Manifesto which uh, brought to the world this idea of Marxism or what we call modern-day communism um, and he called religion the opium of the people um, he believed that man created religion and he created it to help soothe himself um, much like opium is a painkiller so God is a painkiller for the problems that ail the humans his belief in communism was predicated on the idea that everyone works equally for the benefit of the state or their government therefore religion had no place in society because that takes people away from their focus on the government and gives them an inner spiritual life so he was very much against the idea of religion being a dominant force in a person's life so ultimately he believed that religion is the consciousness and self-esteem of a man who has not yet found himself and when a man does find himself and knows who he is his identity he can then move beyond religion and again these are the theories of these particular men and now we're going to go to our good friend Sigmund Freud who worked in the late 19th early 20th century um, he added psychology to the mix and his whole perspective is that God is a father substitute he saw religion as coming from the guilt that men supposedly feel in hating their fathers and most teenage boys will say at some point that they hate their dads mostly when they're trying to control their behavior and it is part of maturity part of the natural order of things to disobey and separate from one's father um, and because of the time that Freud was writing in he didn't really care too much about women he focused his research on men and then just figured it's all the same for everyone Freud saw religion as a way to appease the father through deferred obedience meaning I am not going to listen to my own biological father but I am going to follow the rules of Jesus and God and that is my way of obeying um, so it's kind of a trade-off you're trading your real father for your spiritual father um, ultimately Freud believed that a healthy person should live without religion and um, obviously you know it goes into this idea that when one is able to control their own wishes and desires they don't need a spiritual or supernatural force to help them out so this is the end of this PowerPoint um, it will also be on the quiz next week if you have questions please make sure you text or email me and um, I hope you have a great few days